Okay, hello everyone and welcome to Concordia University's fourth space. Thank you for joining us for today's event, The Iron Ring with Abir Fakhreddin. To help situate you, we are streaming to YouTube live from fourth space, which is located on unceded indigenous lands in Jajage, Montreal. At fourth space, we work with our university community to mobilize knowledge by co-creating daily activities to examine the research questions and projects in development here at the university. With that, it is now my pleasure to hand it over to your host today, Amelia, Alex, and Shrab. Hello, hello. Welcome back to a new episode of The Iron Ring. I'm your host, Amelia, and this year we'll, we'll have two new hosts. We have Alex over here, we have Shrab as well. Um, Alex is a mechanical engineering student. Shrab is a software engineering student, first year. Yeah, first year. First year. <laughs> So uh, before we begin, we'd like to firstly thank the Four Space for allowing us to film over here. And we'd also like to quickly thank our bronze sponsor, ABB. Their generous support empowers women in the engineering community by enabling us to really organize a lot of conferences, events, competitions, and they provide a lot of essential resources for aspiring female engineers. So today we have a beer. Today we have a beer Fakhreddin with us. Welcome, Abir. Uh, she is a Concordia alumni who has a passion for innovative technologies that have a social impact, as well as a passion for education and empowering aspiring STEM enthusiasts. So thank you for being here today with us. And we would also like to congratulate you for winning the Woman Who Spark Award as part of the utility industry. Can you tell us a little bit about that too? I mean, that's super, super awesome. You know, <laughs> she was telling us before that she's the, the youngest and yeah. so please tell us what the award is, how you know this came into fruition. You know? <laughs> well, first of all, thank you so much for having me here. I'm thrilled to be here. Um, so the, the award I recently won is actually part of a, uh, the organization is called U2030 Collaborative. And um, it's uh, basically a collaborative that's put together by pioneers in the utility industry. Uh, to honor women who work in the utility industry. So we're talking about women who work in the customer service industry or as power engineers, um, even, you know, in supply chain. And I think, you know, a lot of uh, a lot of us females, we don't get enough recognition for that. So uh, the award I recently won um, two weeks ago, I was actually in Los Angeles to accept the award. Um, it was uh, the Young Achiever Award and it's for my, uh, you know, contribution to the utility industry. I'll be talking a little bit more about what I do and how I collaborated to that industry. Um, but basically it's it's towards the technological contributions I've made to the utility industry and making the grid smarter. Um, That's awesome. Yeah, it was, it was definitely fantastic. I was also the only Montrealer there uh, and, that... and the youngest person. I mean, everyone must have been at least 20 years older. So uh, wow. yeah, wow. to so say it was a little bit intimidating is an understatement, but, but you're there. I you definitely learned <laughs> a lot and, you know, made some great connections and, and just got some really helpful hints and tips from very empowered and, and strong women in the industry. So that's fantastic. Awesome. That's an amazing achievement. Yeah, thank yeah. you. Yeah, yeah, thank you. So how does it feel like to be back on campus? <laughs> <laughs> so I was just telling Amelia and Alex that right before coming in here, I went up to the fourth floor and of the library and, um, you know, it's just changed massively. Um, I feel like, you know, when I was still here, I got the short end of the stick because they was they were still renovating. But, you know, the elevators are it's still always like that. When you leave, that's when it becomes yeah. cool. But, you know, I was I was really happy. I mean, it, it looks beautiful. You have yeah. green walls and, and the spaces look really open and, and it looks great. The bathrooms and elevators are still pretty traumatizing, but yeah. everything else is fantastic. I was uh, very excited to see that, you know, almost at every corner, they had a lot of um, ads about digital catalogs and the archives related to AI and how AI can help psychology, social sciences and business. So I think those are great reads that everybody should should pick up. Yeah, I mean, Concordia has been, I think, under renovations for the last like. <laughs> I don't know, since I've been here and, you know, the fourth floor was just finished, I think, like last semester only. Yeah. And so it's been it a lot of things. Fantastic. It's looking good. It's yeah. looking good. It's come a yeah. long way. There's going to be constant improvements, too, when, we, when we're gone Yeah, when well. we leave, it's going to be way better. <laughs> yeah. 100%. <laughs> so you obtained your bachelor's in mechanical engineering, right? Correct. Yes, I obtained my bachelor's in mechanical engineering, um, and I specialized in systems and mechatronics. How would you nice. describe your time at Concordia? <laughs> 
Wow. Um, <laughs> in like a sentence. It was <laughs> just exorbitant. Yeah. Out of this world, fantastic. And were you a part of like any clubs or societies? The question is, what wasn't I part of? <laughs> oh. um, yeah, actually, I, I did. And, and I did a little, you know, thing where every year I uh, chose what I wanted to remain consistent in and an active member of. And then I tried something new. So my first year, I, uh, you know, I joined Engineers Without Borders. I knew exactly what I wanted to do. I was VP fundraising. I did some really cool events. And then I joined Space Concordia shortly after. Oh, okay. uh, I was on the thermal, uh, thermal team for the satellite. Um, and then the year after that, I volunteered for Frosh. And um, you know, I continued to work with EWB, but I joined Eng Games, where you know, I, I worked a lot with the academic team and the social team. And I was part of the delegation. And that's where I made a lot of the friends that I still have today. I mean, it's, wow. it's really a community. And then my third and fourth year, the consistent part was ECA. Uh, back then, mm -hmm. it was the Engineering and Computer Science Association. Um, I, re I was a very active member there. So I started as VP Academic, where you know I was fortunate enough to organize events like Iron Ring and graduation wow. and introduce Eng Olympics um, to the student delegation. Um, so Eng Olympics is basically a series of competitions where students, teams of four have to compete. I brought in uh, industry judges and the winners of each uh, competition would uh, go on to represent Concordia and the delegation as part of the CQI, uh, Competition Québécoise d'Ingénierie. And then my final year, I um, continued to be part of ECA as VP Comps, uh, but I joined SAE for my capstone. So as you can see, the pattern here is I always maintained a communal contribution where I felt like I can contribute to the community. And we'll talk about that a little bit more. But the other part, I always joined the club where I can um, hone my technical skills. Mm -hmm. So there were always, you know, two uh, thoughts, two school of thoughts behind why I joined every club. How did you have time to do anything? <laughs> I just feel like that was so many different societies yeah. and clubs in general. It's awesome, though. That's like kudos to you to be able to do that. And I think it's good to have your foot in kind of every door, see what you like, what you don't like is super important, too. So absolutely. How did you make time for it? So on top of that, I was I was working, wow. right? So um, I was TAing and I was working at the writing center. For those of you who are unaware, there's a, a really awesome writing center in the hall building. It offers free services to students. Yes. They check your resumes, your CVs, your papers. I think it's, it's on the fourth floor. Um, and you can even take appointments online through your portal. I didn't even know that. Yeah, yeah. so please take a look because uh, the writing assistants there are amazing. So I used to work there, I TA'd, and I used to work at a really cool Lebanese spot called Garage Beirut until I got my first internship. And then mm. one internship led to another, and I, I focused on that. Uh, and of course, classes. I mean, I always went to classes. But I think the key to all of this is that I was extremely homesick and, mm. you know, okay. being far away from your family. I mean, you have some motivation to succeed mm. um, and prove yourself. Right. So that that was for me the biggest motivation. It must have been hard if you're homesick, but then also you meet a lot of great people, make good connections in general. So I feel like there's like a good way to look at it and like the obviously the little cons. But I think that overall was like a good way to keep yourself busy and to, you know, involve yourself and see again what you like and what you don't like because i feel like that's an issue for us is like you know we go into this program but we don't know what we like and you know mechanical Absolutely. engineering is vast for us even software you can do a lot of different industries so you know kind of going through everything i feel like it's really good for you to to test out what you like and what you don't like uh, absolutely and i think i mean a you know, when you asked me, how did you manage to juggle all of that? Yes, there were times where I felt like I dropped the ball in some places. Um, but I think what keeps you going is not thinking that I have to do this. I have to attend this meeting okay. and I have to go to class. It's why are you doing all of this? I mean, I think a lot of times, um, you know, people just kind of lose track and lose sight of why they're doing what they're doing and they end up being overwhelmed. Yeah. And so just ask yourself why. For me, I, I knew I was being involved because I've I knew I could make a difference in my community. And engineering to me is all about community. I mean, if you ask me what the number one trait of being a successful engineer is, it's resourcefulness. And you build that trait out of being part of a community. So, you know, I wanted to build that. And then every other reason was, you know, honing whatever skill you were looking for. And how could you figure out, you know, 
un unfortunately, the way some of our classes are structured, it leaves you a little bit lost as to what you're interested in. Yeah. And but at Concordia, you know, as opposed to some other universities in Quebec, we have really great societies and, and people who are super involved and really helpful. So use that to your advantage. Treat it as part of your coursework to understand mm -hmm. what kind of skills you'd like to to work on. And I think that's why we all kind of join, you know, yeah, at least women yeah. in engineering. It's a yeah. great society to kind of gain different types of experiences because we're, we're like the society is not technical. Like it's not like Space yeah. Concordia, but you learn how to interact with, you know, Absolutely. sponsors, people, you know, different organized events. Like yeah. it, you learn a lot. So I think it's a good thing. You learn a lot about like the importance of just having like those soft skills behind like before entering your career. Absolutely. And networking on top of it. Like, too. Yeah. Everything. And yeah. I mean, um, you know, what's wonderful about being in a flexible environment like an academic institution is you have the power in the student body to tailor the mission of your organization. So let's yeah. say in one of the years you had a, um, a delegation or a community in WIE who are more interested in learning about hands-on technical skills. I mean, there's nothing stopping you right now from organizing an event that's it could be, you know, like a smart grid building workshop or a robot building workshop. I mean, there's nothing stopping you. You can create your own competition. Like there's that's what's <laughs> yeah. wonderful about being in this environment. Mm -hmm. Right. So I think it's, it's great. Well, it's great to bring up because we actually are the competitions team as yeah. well. <laughs> and it's our second year that we're going to be doing it. So we'll talk after we will talk after we will be making sure that we talk after. Oh. So how would you say that the societies and the clubs you were in influenced your career path once you graduated? Um, I would not have gotten my first internship had it not been for my involvement with the ECA. Um, I would not have gotten my second internship had it not been, you know, with my involvement with people that I met through societies and clubs. And I definitely wouldn't have gotten my dream you know, job right out of university had it not been um, for like my involvement in competitions. I mean, I got recruited at CQI, which is the Competition Québécoise d'Ingénierie or the Quebec Engineering Competitions. Um, I was recruited there by a company that had never really hired anyone from Concordia, right? Because they're purely francophone and um, it was it was fantastic. I mean, I, I think it tremendously influenced my my career, my trajectory, and it continues to do so. Yeah. That's really awesome. cool. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, it really is important. And like even new people coming into engineering, I always stress how important joining a society is or doing internships and just making those connections because it really contacts that get you everywhere yeah. at the end of the day, yeah. you know. I think Absolutely. that's something that I my parents drilled into my head already before. But I never even in CJ for me or high school, I was never a student who really kind of thought that clubs were important until I got here and realized that, you know, even if you may not have had an internship, having a part in a society can give you that, okay, you went outside of classes and now of course. you yeah. have that like skill and, you know, employers do like that a lot at the end Absolutely. of the day. So just even any other extracurriculars too, it just shows how you can balance, how you can manage things, yeah. how you're a diverse person, you're doing different yeah. things. And so that's, the way to yeah. lead to the career like honestly absolutely and, and just to put things in perspective i graduated with three or four internships and i was never part of co-op oh, oh wow. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. yeah sure getting to my first internship was very stressful i had yeah. to learn how to deal <laughs> yeah. with rejection it wasn't easy but but yeah i mean you you need that one person to just give you a shot and yep. and then that's it yeah for sure no exactly it's super important but yeah, yeah. <laughs> So moving on to post uh, university, <laughs> you worked at BRP as a mechatronics engineer, mm -hmm. right? What drew you to this special specialization and how was your experience there? Um, I kind of always knew that I wanted something to do with technology. And, you know, when I say robotics, I don't necessarily mean, I mean, yes, I was really interested in, in building robots, but I always knew I, um, I was really interested in how systems worked amongst each other, you know, how machines commun can communicate and, you know, creating a smarter world for everyone, because I'm a big fan of efficiency. Um, and so I kind of always knew and, and I, I just.
cruised by my first two years. I was involved in some of my technical involvement in societies to understand what are the skills I liked and didn't like. Mm -hmm. So, you know, my involvement with the Space Concordia, I was doing thermodynamics. Well, that was very interesting to me. I knew I didn't want to do it for a career, right? Yeah. So the more involved I, I got and the more I tested my technical skills, I understood that, you know, I like to build things, take them apart, understand how they work. And mechatronics for me was just all of that put in together. And it was a project based, um, you know, project based track, which for me is how I learn. Um, so that was kind of what I wanted to do. And then I, I got extremely lucky at uh, CQI and, and I got headhunted by, um, you know, by their engineers and their HR. And uh, yeah, I was actually their first diagnostic engineer, um, the first female in the R&D uh, department. You're talking yeah. about 350 engineers. Yeah, I, <laughs> uh, I actually left Montreal for three years to work at BRP. So for those of you who are unfamiliar, BRP is actually the, um, the origin story of Bombardier. So uh -huh. Bombardier, Bombardier Recreational Products uh, was founded by Joseph Armand Bombardier when he invented the first snowmobile in his garage in Valcourt, Quebec, yep. which is about two hours away from Montreal. Uh, and the the headquarters right now is still there. I mean, it's an international company. They've got you know branches everywhere around the world, um, but that's really where the R and D takes place. So for anybody to work as an engineer there, they have to move. And so I moved to Granby never having visited Granby. I moved to Granby like wow. right after graduation, did not speak French at the time. <laughs> wow. So I just kind of, you know, took that chance. Uh, and a year later into my job, you know, I became super fluent. I was sending technical emails in French. That's you know, hard. I was taking <laughs> like engines apart on the shop floor. I mean, it was very challenging to put yourself in a situation like this, but why else would I have slaved away for four years and, you yep. know, barely gotten any sleep if it was not to, Do you something you know that to conquer yeah yeah something like that so it was definitely my dream job uh, I mean you got to play around with uh, toys all day and try to break them so <laughs> you know fun. they make uh, sidus ATVs uh, snowmobiles and so I got to um, calibrate the software for the engine and the vehicle do the validation on those and test the vehicles trying to break them so figure out if there's a reaction in case of malfunction and I can, you know, I was doing that all over the world. I was doing that in Florida to test the CDUs. I was doing that in Austria for the engines. I was doing that in Cook in Quebec for the skidoos. So it was, it was really interesting. Yeah, it was an amazing wow. job. I mean, I loved it. And but definitely living in the countryside for <laughs> three years, I'm, I really got to know Quebec on a different level and I would, I would move back. I, really? loved, yeah. I loved it, yeah. I, know, I think that's the one place I wouldn't think about going to yeah. off the top of my head. You know? yeah, it, was, it was really cool. But you get an opportunity and it's, you decide, you know, should I just go and throw myself into something or, you know, think of maybe another opportunity. But I think it's one super brave that you just decided, you know, I'm going to, I was in Montreal, but now I'm going to move somewhere else entirely yeah. where I don't speak fluently, you know, the language yeah. and yeah. pursue that and, you know, come out still successful out of all of that. That's super rewarding, I feel like. It is. And um, you learn a lot about yourself, you know? Um, I mean, I, I moved here. So for, you know, for those of you who are unfamiliar, I'm Lebanese. I was born and raised in Dubai. Uh, I was in uh, Lebanon for a couple of years before coming to Montreal. And I mean, I moved to Montreal without ever visiting. So what was going to stop me from doing true. it again, yeah. right? Um, especially if I was, you know, going to a great company, learning a new skill and a new language, why not? I mean, what's stopping me? I can always move back if I don't like it. Mm -hmm. I think a That's lot of true. people put this imaginary block, mental block, and oh, yeah. if you really think about it, very few things in life are irreversible. So That's a nice way to look at life yeah. in general. I feel, like, <laughs> I, just, I feel like when we're young and we're not sure what to go into, what to do, that we kind of panic at the same time where we want to do so many things, but then change is scary but then also you know yeah what if i don't like it you kind of put every scenario in your head before even thinking about but what if what about the experience that i'll get out of that you know yeah absolutely you like block yourself almost a little bit but i'm yeah. i'm glad you had a really good experience it must have been nice again different scenery you did move to montreal which is already a bold thing as well to go to a new yeah. you know country in, in, in general a new area like new language yeah so it's yeah. that's awesome and and i, I never looked back since so you're happy here in Montreal? Yeah, I love it. It's actually just 
on the 10th, I celebrated my nine year anniversary. Oh, <laughs> so, yeah, very, so very. Clearly, you like it. Yeah, I love yeah. it. <laughs> well, now, from what we understand, you don't work at BRP anymore, right? I do not. You work at. Shout out to everyone who does, though. It's a great place. <laughs> like, shout out. But now you work at a company. I don't know if I'm saying this right. You, Ubiquia? Ubiquia? Ubiquia, yes. Okay. Can you kind of give talk about their initiative, what they do, and what you do with the company as well? Sure. So, uh, Ubiquia is a startup that's based in Fort Lauderdale, Florida. Um, so a couple of years a, a couple of years ago, they acquired the Montreal office that was part of the GE Smart City uh, department at the time. So they acquired that office and the Montreal office really focuses on the AI machine learning uh, initiative. So the AI machine learning and technology part of the company, everything else in Florida is, you know, the hardware engineering supply chain marketing. Um, it's a great startup. I mean, it's a little bit of a mid-sized startup now, around 250 employees, okay. um, or a little bit less. And they're really focused on, you know, making uh, cities smarter, making gr grid smarter, and making those two um, kind of components a lot more connected. So the concept behind the smart city is, is a little bit different than a smart grid. So the concept behind a smart city is really deploying a few IoT sensors, as we call them. So, okay. you know, uh, sensors that are able to communicate using a specific protocol. So either LTE, which is what your cell phone uses, or Wi-Fi, or, you know, other, other means. Um, and then being able to control certain aspects of the city and optimize the performance of those aspects um, automatically. So you're talking about traffic lights, uh, lamp posts, you're mm -hmm. talking about street analytics, uh, cameras for public safety. You can even have, you know, things like gunshot detection um, wow. that are detected by a microphone and then you deploy like a, a machine learning model to understand what decibel it is and whether it, wow. it can be uh, categorized as a gunshot or not. Cool. So that's when you're talking about smart cities and this is one of, you know, millions of applications that you can use. When you're talking about smart grid, and this is something that's extremely important, you're talking about making the grid smarter depending on where you are in the world. So yeah. in Canada, we have extremely cold weather, and a lot of times yeah. our grid can be overutilized because of the um, the pressure and the impact that we put, because we use a lot of heating, for example, or during uh, snowstorms. Mm -hmm. And then in the summer, that really big change, unfortunately due to climate change, that really big change uh, and drop in, and rise in temperature yeah. can cause your power lines to just completely sag, right? Yeah. And that can cause a lot of fires because you have a phenomenon called current leakage. So as your plants are drying up, right, because you have really harsh winters, it's not raining as much, and then you've got current leakage from all the sag happening in your power lines, that's how fires are started. Yeah. And if, you know, unfortunately, we've had really awful weather this summer in Montreal because... <laughs> yeah you know, because of the fires that were happening in Quebec. Is that... And, you know, all of that is impacted by global warming, right? And we don't have the, the technology right now to detect those things in advance mm -hmm. and to prepare for them. And what I do is exactly that. It's trying to come up with a technology to understand the different elements of the grid, understand if we can predict faults in advance, that can help optimize how utilities are distributing power to the people, um, electrical power, and how uh, users are consuming that. And using technology, AI, machine learning to kind of understand those different trends and patterns on the grid, the different trends and patterns in behavior, and, and try and basically optimize that. That's One, very cool. Yeah, really yeah. cool. Just who would I, have known utilities are so interesting, right? Uh, oh, yeah, yeah, when you just say utilities, you don't think about like every single like detail that actually could yeah. be of importance. Which and is and that's just one example. That's one yeah. use case. So it's, I keep, you know, especially now with, you know, we had this winter, the that storm that like knocked out all the power also like all over Montreal and, yeah. and other places around too. Like I, I just, you know, that's also a factor you've got to consider from other perspectives, but you're right. Global warming is, you know, Exactly, but but that's something that could have been predicted because it's not the first outage that happens in yep. the past 10 years. Mm -hmm. So all you need is a data set with all your variables defined and you just need to understand how those variables are working together. Yeah. And you can you can prepare people for this. I mean, I was 
you know, I had a bit of PTSD because I lived in Beirut for a bit and, and we didn't have power for a while. And I and then I, I lost power this summer and I was like, are you kidding? Like, <laughs> seriously, is this happening? Again? Like, so, you know, obviously I'm very privileged to be living here and I'm, I'm very fortunate, but people and utilities, governments and cities, which are, you know, I work in a B2B um, kind of enterprise. Okay. So our customers are really utilities, um, municipalities, uh, school districts, cities, and so on, right? So yeah. um, if you're talking about the smart city, I mean, there's a lot of things that mayors and governors can do to help protect their city and help optimize air quality in the city, help optimize traffic, it's a lot. But when you're talking about utilities, which is actually where you can make the biggest impact yeah. on your citizens, I mean, there's a lot of work to be done there. And it's, it's very interesting. So this company, I know you said it's not necessarily, it's a startup, but it's still, it's, it's building up now. Yeah. Um, how do you find working in a company like this versus a company that was, I guess, established for a long time? Yeah, it's <laughs> different. Day and night, <laughs> yeah, day and okay. night. Uh, one of the reasons I made the conscious decision to, to, I mean, you know, within my third year at BRP, it, it's so funny how, how life works and you can call it manifestation or whatever it is. <laughs> but I, I knew that I wanted to um, dabble around with um, smart cities because okay. while I was working at BRP, I started to work with IOTs and, you know, figuring out how to make all our like uh, uh, vehicles interconnected and mm -hmm. have like a communication system across all of them. And I was working on that protocol. And I started to think about how we can apply that for cities. I mean, you know, like a lot of big companies like Siemens and Philips already dominate the smart city industry. Yeah. Right. So I, I was really interested in that. Um, and lo and behold, I got a text from, you know, a, an old peer at Concordia. Uh, you know, she was like, are you interested in making a career switch? And it was to product management and wow. you know i was an r d mechatronics engineer i kind of always knew i was interested in product but had no idea what product is and i i think we're going to talk about that in a bit and um yeah I, I i never looked back i mean i just knew it in my gut i was like okay i love this job but but it's time to move on because you knew that's kind of what you liked a lot you had that yeah, like, it was, idea it was definitely that was scary though because you know i was moving from a company that was very structured but yeah. was not afraid of innovation which is very important to me yeah because previously i had done all my internships in aerospace and i really did not enjoy it yeah. uh, it's you know it, it's not for me i prefer yeah. more dynamic innovative environments um and so I was, I was worried because I was very taken, well taken care of at BRP. I loved the innovation. I was traveling a lot. I was having a lot of fun. Uh, but, you know, it was time to go from being small fish in a big pond to, you know, big, big fish, fish in a small, small pond. pond yeah. <laughs> um, but it's not just that, you know, it, it was time to take more ownership. And I was always curious to understand how it was like working at a startup. So, yeah. Did you have any doubts? You know, I mean, you're always going to have a bit of doubts, right? Mm -hmm. um, you know, I wasn't just moving jobs. I was moving cities, like yeah. breaking my lease, moving back to, to the city. I mean, it was, it was a whole thing. I was once again uprooting my whole life. So sometimes, yes, you doubt yourself, but not in the, hey, is this job right for me? It's in the, is this a pattern that I'm doing? So am I disrupting my life because it's a pattern or is this really something I want to do? Um, I do have one thing to say, though, if there's anything I've learned is do not chase the title, it's chase the industry. And that's exactly what I was doing. That's why when it comes to the professional part of my life, I have no doubt. That's awesome. Though. Yeah. It's hard to, I feel like, say, you know, at least again, when you're young, it's always when you're young, because you get the experience, like you said, you had internships that you were like, I didn't like them necessarily, but you know, maybe the industry, but then you realize too, that's not what you preferred. You went into another industry and then tested that out and you're like, you know what, this is leading me to even more thoughts about something yeah. else. And then you got an opportunity at a company that is doing something that you are clearly passionate about, which I think is, again, awesome because this is, you know, we are, you know, here in Montreal, it is, we are privileged. We do have a lot of cool technology, but I mean, you can make things way better for the people living there. Absolutely. There's always improvement. Yeah. No matter Definitely. what. So it's awesome that, you know, you're doing this and you enjoy doing this too. I do. Yes. Thankfully. 
<laughs> Thankfully. And one thing that I, will, I really want to focus on, because I think a lot of us never know whether it's better to go to a big company. Yes. Most of the time, we're that's the path that we take because we think we're going to be more secure. And then some people yes. are like, oh, but a startup could be cool. What would you what kind of advice would you give to those people trying to decide between the two? Yeah. So um, before I, I, you know, decided to go with BRP, I did have a couple of other offers from so smaller companies. Um, I think you have to be a little bit strategic about your decision. So if it's a job you like combined with an industry you like, and a company that is known for its good culture. So everybody, you know, the first thing you do when you get an offer, go to Glassdoor and figure out how the company <laughs> culture is, because yeah. that will make or break your decision. Yeah. Um, you know, the company culture combined with the industry and the role, I think those three should be the main deciding factors. Not salary, not signing bonus, none of that. When you're first starting your career, that shouldn't matter, right? Yeah. Um, if it's a big name, a reputable name with a good working culture and the, the role that you want, where you feel like you can grow skills off of that foundation, go for it. Otherwise, it's OK to start with a small company, yeah. but definitely, you know, the balance is always going to go in the favor of a bigger company that's offering you something you want, even if it's just for the first year because it'll give you more options. Yeah. yeah. You, you wanna have more options. And that's just at the beginning of, of your career, right? Yeah. Afterwards, when you're confident with your skills and everything that you've contributed, it doesn't matter anymore. I feel like it's good that students get the chance to try both almost, because I know I just finished an internship at a smaller company and my internship previously was at a big company. So they were both great and they both had you know pros and cons in their own way, but I feel like the dynamic in a small industry is different than a dynamic yeah. in a big industry. And you have to know if you like that. And Absolutely. So I think that if students can do both, they should. And I know it's obviously hard with like I, I did both and I agree completely. Yeah. Also, you have to think about what kind of work you want to be doing. I know out of university, it's a little bit tough to figure out <laughs> what you want to be doing. But if you want to just learn, you know, one to let's say five skills, right, mm -hmm. that you think you can learn from this team, then go for that. But if, if you're still not sure and you want to learn the ropes, go for the bigger company because they often have programs, you know, rotation yeah, yeah. programs where you can kind of move around and, and figure out where you want. Yeah, yeah, there's definitely more opportunities within the company itself, different positions and all that. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. I think a major thing also with startups versus bigger companies is really the community also as well because you're going from a huge company with, I don't know, over 200 500 no, employees yeah. like a lot to maybe like a 50 yeah, person exactly company so it's like that dynamic like you were saying really changes just within the community. absolutely do you think you have more responsibility in a smaller company yeah definitely uh, i mean the responsibilities you have in a smaller company extend way beyond your mandates and your scope um and i mean you have bigger visibility for sure especially if you have a, a manager or a supervisor that empowers you and gives you that kind of visibility. But definitely, yes, in a smaller company, um, you have a lot more impact, which depending on who you are as a person, you know, can make or break your, your career at that company. That makes a big difference. I feel like the kind of mentors you have and it can make, like you said, make or break whatever, you know, industry or field you might think you love something so much and you have someone who doesn't really help you out and you're like, well, yeah my perception of everything changed all of a sudden exactly. i think that's important and i think it's great that you are able to also come back and like give kind of that advice to people too because i feel like you know you're you're still young and doing a lot of different you know stuff at different i mean you worked in one company now you're at a different one but you with university as well you try different things and i think it's a <clears throat> good example to students to know you know where can i go what can i do to help myself out a little bit so i think that's that's great yeah yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm fortunate, of course, like I said, but I think what also helped me is I did a lot of internships in small companies and big companies. Yeah. Um, and, you know, like I said, they were in aerospace. Uh, I think that that also helped me kind of figure out what the, you know, right track is, mm -hmm. for sure.
are you are we allowed to ask like what exactly you're working on right now like your exact you know little um, project or you were not allowed to ask <laughs> i can i can tell you the scope okay. of, of what yeah. i'm doing so i currently at uh, ubiquia i am a senior product manager so i manage two um large portfolios two of the biggest portfolios at the company so it's the grid portfolio the the ub grid uh portfolio and those are basically we have a few sensors in that grid um, the distribution transformer monitor. So it's a sensor, sensor that goes on transformers and is able to capture a lot of the data and then you know, do a lot of post-processing on the cloud um, and apply a lot of those machine learning algorithms I was talking about to figure out you know, where we can predict faults, how we can do that. Uh, if there's a fault that occurred, what were the conditions during that fault? Yeah. So all of those things are things that I'm working on. Um, and then my other you know, I consider it to be my baby is um, is UbiView, which is basically a web app. It's a cloud management platform. It's where all the data from all our sensors uh, get reported. So our customers, when they want to see how their sensors are doing, how the city is doing or their grid, they log into UbiView and they can view their deployments there. So deployments are basically the installations of their assets or the units on, you know, either the streets or the transformers. Um, and UbiView is basically, I mean, think of it as a tool, right? So you've got trends and data and graphs and charts, uh, schedules, and I mean, it, it's, a, it's a very powerful tool, right? So I work with, on, on the grid side, I'm working with a lot of R&D engineers, power engineers, electrical, firmware, software. On okay. the UbiView side, it's a lot of cloud, UI, UX. So that was like a whole new world I didn't even know existed when I was studying engineering. You know, Things change. it's not about like, it's not website design, it's designing the experience of the user, mm. which right now I think is something that's very interesting to me. And it's how to use that data to enhance the, the, the user experience. So that's a, a big part of what I'm working on right now. Uh, I can't say more. <laughs> that's okay. That's okay. But yeah, that's really cool. That is really cool. How do you feel about then, you know, AI as a whole? Because I know people are scared of it, and like, you know, the way that things change. Like even now, I keep hearing on my, on like social media, people re replacing like voices of other people, you know, things like that. But do you really think that AI is? I mean, I think it's a great tool. Do you think it's gonna go? like in a better direction? Do you think it's going to take, the things that people are scared about is like, oh, it's going to take my job. It's going to do this. It's going to do that. Do you feel like that's where AI in general is headed or you think no? So I'm no expert. I mean, I just have experience in what I'm working on right now and what I read and, and people I've spoken to. But I mean, there are a lot of ways to think about this. So, um, you know, typically people in, let's say, more blue collar working jobs. So you know, whether it's baggage handling at the airport or plumbing or like electricians. I mean, actually a study that was recently conducted by MIT states that, that those levels of industry are the least likely to be replaced by AI mm -hmm. because you need manual labor. Yeah. And, and usually you would think that those are the people who are worried about AI replacing their jobs, yet they're the least likely to be replaced. In fact, you know, they're more likely to have um, a higher raise in their hourly uh, pay than engineers in the next 10 years, right? Um, so if we're going to look at the industry itself, blue collar, I don't think there's a lot of, um, you know, there's a lot of threat there. I think when it comes to AI taking over jobs, you have to be a little bit more specific. You know, I, I do believe in evolution. I think that when people are challenged, they tend to pick up new skills, learn new skills to become more relevant. And I think that's what AI is doing. It's challenging us. I don't think that it's going to replace multiple jobs because it's always going to need the human innovation yeah. and creativity to continue learning and enhance, right? Um, but I, I don't really think that it's going to completely replace uh, people. Okay. Yeah. It's scary sometimes. So you're saying it might replace engineers? <laughs> <laughs> should we be scared? I mean, um, maybe, uh, you know, we should pick up the pace, up the pace. a little. <laughs> yeah, we've got to work our minds, be faster, be quicker, yeah. figure out, advance before they advance. Yeah, I mean, um, you know, they say, um, that there, there's a quote that I really like, and it says, necessity is the mother of invention. 
Mm. Right? And yeah. I, I think that we're really going to be a lot more innovative and push the envelope in the next few years just to kind of win that race. And, and we'll yeah. do it. I have no doubt. That's, yeah. a, that's a nice quote. I never heard that before. Yeah. I like that. Yeah. All right. Are we... Oh, so <laughs> as we're nearing the end of the podcast, I would like to ask you, what advice would you give to um, engineering students that are graduating and entering the work field? Um, this is good for us. We have a year left. Is, like, <laughs> we're, we're entering. <laughs> this is great. Uh, no pressure, though. <laughs> uh, I mean, what advice would I give to engineering students who are nearing the, their yeah, graduation? Yeah. Well, first of all, congrats, you made it. That's <laughs> yeah. a huge achievement. Yeah. You guys have no idea. Um, I don't know what, what the statistic was, but around like 30% of people who go into engineering and end up dropping out by the, yeah. by the third year, actually. Uh, which is totally fine. I mean, power to you if you figured out what, what else you wanted to do. But congrats, it's a really big achievement. So make sure you, you're always kind to yourself. Pat your, yourself on the back because we don't do that. I mean, <laughs> yeah. you know, we tend to be really hard on ourselves. Yeah. And, you know, we want to do it all, especially students who are working or students who are involved. Um, we want to do it all and you know we think that if we get like a b minus or a c or something or we fail a class it's the end of the world no one cares all right yeah. the only time i think it's important to maintain you know good structure for for discipline maintain a good gpa if you want to do your master's phd all of that but i mean just be kind to yourself right that's the first thing have a hobby right <laughs> if you if you had hobbies before going into engineering try to keep them and if you figured out that you have new hobbies then nurture those whatever it is don't just focus on school i mean mm -hmm. go out there be involved build stuff break stuff push the envelope interview people start a podcast you know yeah. do anything just have a hobby because it's an outlet mm -hmm. and it's going to help you learn more about what, you, what you're studying um if you're look if if you want some career advice, I would definitely say, do not be overwhelmed by what everyone else around you is doing. You know, nobody in my graduating class moved to Granby. <laughs> I didn't care. Yeah, it, I didn't doubt myself. It, it doesn't mean I'm doing something wrong. It's just different. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, you know, definitely chase the industry, chase the knowledge. Do not chase the salary. Do not chase the status quo, do not chase the title, because all of that will come if you're doing things for the right reasons. So That's that would advice. definitely be my biggest advice. Alex, we gotta keep this in our head. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, with a year left, we're like, oh my God, like things are starting to, you know, wrap up. And we're yeah. it's, it's it is nerve wracking, but it's good to know, you know, I think trusting yourself and kind of what you yeah. like to do and just Of course trust yourself. I mean, you made it this far. We did. No one sat there and took these exams for you. You did. So yeah. trust yourself. And I would say, especially <laughs> to female engineers out of there, speak up. Mm -hmm. I mean, nobody's going to do that for you. you. You have to do it. And make sure you stick together. I mean, the community that you built in university is, is really fantastic. It's empowering. It, it'll be there for you even in, in the lowest times. So just make sure you stay in touch with those people, even if it's just for a coffee every now and then. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And you already have a lot in common. You've survived a lot <laughs> of microaggressions yeah. and yeah. survived a lot of stuff, right? So I would definitely say keep in touch with the community that you've built as well. I have a quick question. Did you ever think of doing a master's? Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I wake up every weekend with a different program in mind, so I haven't decided yes. yet. Uh, I've definitely thought about doing a master's. It's something I'm interested in. I just okay. haven't decided exactly what I want to do yet. Okay, so you'd like to go back and maybe try it out? Yeah, I'm a fan of the academic institution mm -hmm. as like, you know, patriarchal and organized as it can be. I, <laughs> I like the academic institution. I love meeting different people with different mindsets. I think, you know, especially at Concordia, there's so much that classes here have to offer. Um, I just really haven't decided what I want to do yet. So I'm, I'm focusing more on using my career and, you know, taking different certifications and workshops to kind of figure out okay what I want to do yeah. yeah yeah a lot of people think like sometimes it's they should go right into it but then others say oh maybe stay like work a bit get that experience figure out what you'd like to do your research and your master's in 
So what would you say for those people? Who I, I don't think going? there's a right way to do it. No, I, I don't think so. I think uh, there are people I know who did their master's right after university. And I mean, they're in a really good place right now. Um, they knew what they wanted to do. You know, they yeah. were fortunate. I, I had no, I still have no idea what I, <laughs> you know, masters. It's like, I don't know if I want to specialize in this thing. Um, so I think, you know, for, for those people, yeah, kudos to them. It's a, it's a really good idea. There are pro pros and cons, you know, you're, you already have momentum straight out of university. Yeah. Yeah. It's not a bad idea. Um, it really depends on your priorities. My priority was getting my foot in the door. I wanted to mm -hmm gain those technical skills in the industry. So that's what I wanted to do first. But there's no right way or wrong way. Yeah. And what advice would you give for people who are just starting out like me? <laughs> in engineering? Yeah. Be involved, mm -hmm. definitely. You're doing good already. <laughs> I would say no one's going to come and ask you to be involved. Mm -hmm. You know, you go out there, find it. Um, also, you know, when you decide to be part of a society, you haven't signed away your life. If you don't like it, drop out, <laughs> drop out. Just don't burn bridges. Like, don't just not show up. Mm -hmm. Just be like, hey, you know, this isn't aligned with my interests, but I'm going to join this society. I'd love if we can stay in touch and collaborate mm -hmm. on future events. Uh, confrontation, but not in an aggressive way, just in an honest way is very underrated. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people don't do that. It's important. Uh, so I would definitely say be involved. Try not to skip classes. <laughs> it's it's really important yeah. for your professors to know your face, mm -hmm. not yeah. just for those times where you need the extra grades, mm -hmm. you know, but it's it's also for when you're involved in organizing things, they're going to be your allies. Yeah. They're going to speak for you at those, you know, councils where they're voting on bills in university. Um, you know, they're going to choose you for the capstone project. They're going to write you reference letters if you decide to do a master's. So make sure you become friends with your professors and, um, you know, be involved in a way that you can contribute to the community, but think about the soft or hard skills that you want to mm -hmm. nurture yeah. and, and go towards that as well. Um, and for those of you who really want to be involved in the, I don't want to say student politics, because thankfully we don't have a lot of those in the engineering community. Mm -hmm. Um, but, you know, I was an VP academic, I was part of the student committee that voted on bills. Yeah. And that's something not a lot of students know about. So also look that up, be involved. I mean, you can influence how your peers are taking their classes, yeah. what prerequisites are needed for the classes. Like you can make a change in all of these things. I think so. we don't realize that unless you actually start getting involved, like yeah. even yeah. just I've been now, it's going to be my third year part of women engineering, but when I first joined, I didn't know much about the ECA on top of it. Yeah. I just knew my society and then having to work with them and then work with other societies and you're like, there's a whole community. Yeah, yeah. And the don't burn your bridges is always a very good thing because it's again, yeah. you know, you, you never know when someone will, will be able to help you out for something or if you just have like a great contact somewhere as well. Like, and I think just a community that you can go back on, like, the fact that I'm, I'm sure even for you, you got this award recently and then I'm like, I'm sure the peers that worked with you were like, wow, like that's yeah. an awesome achievement for someone that I knew, you know, back at school. Like it's yeah, super cool. Exactly. And just always carry yourself with pride. I mean, remember what, why you're doing what you're doing. Be someone that you'd want to hire. Mm -hmm. Be someone that you, you'd want to yeah. have on your team. You know, I think, yeah, when you do that, it's a good you can handle start. pretty much anything that comes your way. That's good advice. Yeah. I think the most important thing is just to try it out. University, yeah. that's, <laughs> yeah. that's when you have the chance, the opportunity to just try different things. Like I remember when I was looking for a society to join, I didn't, I wasn't sure if I wanted to join women engineering at first because I wanted more of a technical side. And then I tried there that out go. and I realized maybe not. <laughs> and then I went to yeah. women engineering and now, now I'm loving it. Exactly. So try it out. I mean, you said in university, but you know, even in your career, you're allowed to try it out. It's okay. Yeah. I think it's a piece of advice everyone can take in general. Just, you know, yeah. who, if you don't like it, you can always find a way out of it and do something else that you like. As long as you don't burn those bridges. Exactly. Yes. <laughs> the way you go about it is important. Exactly. For sure. So what would you tell your younger self if you had to, like, go back and restart your whole engineering <laughs> Your whole engineering career. The whole thing. Ah. Uh, or would you even say you wouldn't change anything? Like, what would you have advice for yourself? Um, I wouldn't change anything when it comes to my journey. 
I think I would just be a little bit kinder to myself. Mm. Yeah, yeah. I, I had, I mean, you know, I had really high expectations that I always tried to meet. Sometimes I wasn't kind to myself or my body, like pulling all nighters and, uh, you know, just eating Pizza Bella for five nights in a row. <laughs> yeah. I mean, like, shout out to Pizza Bella, but you know, like it was, it was rough. So mm -hmm. I, I'd say definitely be kinder to myself. Uh, and you know that missed lab and heat transfer isn't gonna make or break my <laughs> <laughs> my yeah. degree. So, but apart from that, I'm very happy and mm -hmm. ecstatic to say that I wouldn't change anything. That's yeah. really That's awesome. Good. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. You honestly had a, you, it sounds like you had a great university experience. I really <laughs> did. Yeah. I, I did. And you know, I some people say it's the best. Four, it's like the best seven years or the worst four years or, or whatever the, the quote is. <laughs> yeah. I'd say not necessarily. I mean, some days are good, some days are bad, but just, you yeah. know, yeah. you keep a good support system around you and mm -hmm. you'll be fine. Some days you're loving the program, other days you want to drop out. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. It's, it's like fun. a crisis every semester. At one point when everything like settles in, you're like, should I just stop this? Yeah. Am, I done? This? <laughs> am I done? What am I doing? And then you, you come and you're like, you know what? I just maybe need to let that out and now I'm okay. <laughs> No. So the am I meant for this, I think is going to continue a mm. little bit. I mean, I still have like, I feel like I have imposter syndrome oh. at work, you know, um, it happens. And just knowing that I went through everything I went through and I survived, I made the most out of it just keeps me going even more. Yeah. Um, you also have to be strategic about your options. So yes, so far it's all been, you know, fun and, and great and your gut and intuition, but also think about what's going to give you the most options in life, right? Yeah. You get an engineering degree, I mean, au pire, like you get a, you get a job to pay for your second degree that's in something that yeah. might pay you a little bit less in the future, but just also think about it strategically. Yeah, it's yeah. good advice. Yeah. That's nice. Yeah. <laughs> well, so anyways, so is there anything else that maybe you would like to say to the audience or any other advice or anything specific about your journey that you found was um, something people should know? What's coming up soon? You have other awards that you're winning, you know, <laughs> other stuff like that as well, because that's super awesome. As you know, Concordia alumna, you know, like yeah. good to get it out there. I'm always really proud to represent, you know, Montreal when I'm, you know, I'm doing stuff outside of the city. And I'm really proud to represent Concordia, always. Um, you know, I would just say you're in a really good place. I mean, just the fact that you're here studying whatever it is that you're studying, does, it doesn't matter. Um, you're already in the top 30%, right? Mm -hmm. So just keep going. I know times get, they can be really hard, but just channel your support system, be involved in the community. Don't be shy to ask for help. It's yeah. okay to ask for help. It's okay to not know an answer to a question that all your colleagues solved. It's fine. It doesn't speak anything of your character. If anything, it shows strength. So definitely ask for help. Um, and, you know, reach out on LinkedIn, social media, anything. I'm always up for a chat. Uh, and, and that's it. Yeah. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you so Thank much you. for coming. Honestly, really it was great it. hearing from you. Like, the discussion was amazing. It, there's a lot to learn from your from your journey especially thank and you sir. gave amazing advice to everyone and i yep. really hope the students appreciate that <laughs> thank yeah. you so once again thank you abir and thank you also to the force space for hosting us as well and to abb our sponsor who keeps supporting us uh at women engineer and engineering they have some awesome events all summer so check out their socials and yeah also don't forget to check out our social medias as well at women engineering on instagram facebook websites we have all sorts of events and we will have more podcasts for you in this upcoming year and competition in the future yes, <laughs> yes. stay tuned for that as well <laughs> yeah Perfect. Thank, thank you, you. thank you wow, the girls fun. are awesome <laughs> and uh thank you guys so much um for i guess there's no one in the space, but we're going to close down pretty soon. Um, thank you for that super uh, interesting, engaging, inspiring conversation, which will be up on the internet now as a live streamed event and then eventually as a podcast on every platform. Oh, can you see um, it, right? 
uh, yeah, for you to enjoy as many times as you want. We're going to close up the Zoom now. Thank you guys so much. Have a good afternoon. Wow, this was, you guys are really good. You're cool. You're awesome. You're a great speaker. Yeah, you are. Yeah. Honestly.